Let's see how to set up a multi-tenant development environment for you locally. Check it out. Here's what we're going to build up to here. I have one code base and multiple subdomains. So if I just go to the root domain, we'll see that the team I'm on is the default team. If I go to the Fidelper subdomain, I'm on team Fidelper. If I go to the Foo team, I'm on team Foo, right? Foo subdomain. So what one code base is responding to all my subdomains. This is something that is common in production. What I want to do in this video is check out how to do it locally so you could develop the application as you need to. So let's go ahead and see how to set this up. Okay, so I'll assume you have Brew installed here. If you do not have Brew, uh, go get it. If you don't want to use Brew, use something else, Docker, it doesn't matter. Uh, the point here, the things I'm going to show you uh, will be used no matter what, right? You'll probably use DNS mess no matter what. You might use Nginx no matter what or use something else. But the uh, configuration I show you um, can be done in anything like traffic or caddy, all those other servers. So don't sweat it if you're not using the exact same technologies. Okay, so the next thing I want to show you real quick is that if we head to the browser and go to localhost, you'll see that I just don't have any web server running at all. Like I said, it's a virtual machine. It's a completely fresh install except for a few tools that I wanted here. And we are basically starting from fresh. I also wanted to quickly mention that I'm using PHP here. I am a Laravel developer primarily, so I'm going to use PHP. But if you're not using PHP, that's okay. If you are, here is just a quick thing I did to show you how to install PHP with Brew. The first thing we're going to do is Brew tap uh, Shiva Mathir. I'm sorry, I'm not pronouncing that right. Uh, slash PHP, but that is a good tap, a cask, whatever Brew uses to uh, get PHP. You can install multiple versions and all that good stuff. And it includes PHP FPM and Apache if you want it, but we're not using Apache. So we're going to Brew tap it. That's going to set it up so we can uh, install PHP from this repository. And then we just go ahead and run Brew install. And then the same repository name, it's PHP slash PHP. And we can do at 8.2 because PHP 8.2 is the latest version as of this recording. So we'll go ahead and install that. And then finally, when this finishes, we get this message here. Now, the message has something important in the bottom where it says brew services start and uh, the PHP thing we just installed. So in order to get PHP FPM to start, we just need to run that really quick. Now, we're going to run that as our current user without sudo as well because that will start uh, PHP FPM as our current user, which means it'll have the right permissions to write to our directories. In my case, directories owned by the user Fideliver. So with the formalities out of the way, let's actually get started. The first thing we are going to do here is install DNS mask. DNS mask is a DN server. In other words, a domain name server. What this lets us do is map a host name to an IP address. What we're going to do in our case is map anything that ends in dot test, the dot test TLD. Um, that is going to get mapped to localhost, right? So we have a local web server running. Any domain ending dot test is going to get sent to that web server so our web server can process the request. And this lets us do local development with web applications. So what we want to do here is run brew install DNS mask. That'll go ahead and install. And we'll get a message at the end, a helpful message telling us how to start DNS mask. Now, we'll go ahead and do that. Notice that it says to use sudo, right? sudo brew services start DNS mask. So we'll go ahead and run that. We do want DNS mask to run as user root. OK, so that is installed and running. Let's just take a really quick tour of configuration for Homebrew. It changes every few years. As of now, all this stuff is in slash opt slash Homebrew. And in there, we'll see a configuration that kind of looks like the configuration in the root directory of a Linux server with a var directory and opt and Etsy and all that stuff. We are going to head on into the Etsy directory. We're going to see some DNS configuration. And inside of our DNS configuration, uh, well, we want to make a new configuration file. So DNS mask will load any file underneath the DNS mask.d directory. So we are going to make a file in here called test.conf. Inside of test.conf, we are going to tell DNS mask how to resolve the test, the dot test, TLD to localhost, right? 127001, IPv4 in this case. So that's just address equals slash uh, test. And after the slash test, it's going to be 127001. So the slash test slash here in the middle is just saying anything that ends in dot test should resolve to localhost, right? 127001. So we'll save and quit that, and then we can restart to brew, right? So we'll do sudo brew services restart DNS mask, and that'll do it. And we can give this a quick test. I'm going to use the dig command, which will uh, resolve DNS queries. So we'll do dig foo.test. It doesn't matter. It just has to end in .test, so whatever domain. And we need to use at 127001 to tell us to use a DNS server residing at localhost because our computer is not yet configured to automatically find uh, a DNS server running locally. 
All right, so that did it. We can see the answer section has 127001. Perfect. Okay, so what we need to do next is get the computer to resolve, to use DNS mess to resolve DNS in addition to our usual DNS servers that it might be using. So we will create a new directory called Etsy Resolver under uh, sudo with sudo, so the root user. And inside of that directory, we're going to create a file called test. Inside of there, we're going to say name server 127001. And that is going to tell the computer to also use the name server at localhost to resolve their name names to IP addresses, right? DNS resolution. Okay, so that is all set. Now we can just do a quick test. So I'll do uh, curl and just whatever domain as long as it's a .test TLD. And well, it didn't work, but this is still a good thing. So what this is says is failing to connect on port 80. That's because I sent this request to port 80, but nothing is listening there. There's no web server listening on port 80 yet. But what it did not say is that it could not find the host name. So it actually did resolve this to localhost correctly. Just as proof, we're going to use the dig command to query our computer. And we don't have to use at 127001 to tell it to look at localhost. It should just work. So we'll dig foobar.test and we get a result, right? It says in the answer section that the answer to our DNS query is localhost 127001. Perfect. Okay, so we have DNS resolution down. Let's install a web server. We're going to get Nginx on this computer. I'm going to use brew again to install it. So we'll just do brew install Nginx, right? We don't need a cask or anything. Once that is finished installing, we get our very useful message telling us how to start Nginx. In this case, we want to run Nginx as our current user, which is user fit helper for me. So we're not going to use sudo when we do that. So it's just brew services start nginx. Note that nginx says it's going to start up by default listening on port 8080. So if we make a quick curl request to 8080, we'll see that it actually is not working. So we just need to start nginx. So brew services start nginx with no sudo. We're not running this with sudo because we want it to run as user of developer. In other words, our locally running user here. So that it has permission to read. And I don't think it'll write to any files here, but to read files that we want it to. Once that started, we can do another curl request to port 8080 at localhost and see that it responds, right? So Nginx is running. We'll take a quick look at our configuration here. We see in opt homebrew in the Etsy directory, we have a bunch of stuff, right? One of those is an Nginx directory. So if we head into the Nginx directory, we'll see, you know, all sorts of stuff. The nginx.conf file, fastcgi configurations, all that good stuff that you might typically see in an Nginx installation. Let's head into the servers directory. Inside here, we'll see, well, the directory is empty. But this is where we're going to put configuration for our sites. Let's go ahead and just make a quick curl request to port 80. And we'll see that Nginx is actually not listening on port 80, right? It's only listening on its default site at port 8080. If we check out our log directory, it is actually at var log nginx relative to the opt homebrew directory. And there's not much here, but we see in our access logs, there's just uh, you know a record of a request that we sent to the server. Let's head back to the servers directory where we'll start making some real configuration. So the first thing we're going to do is make a generic configuration that works for me as a PHP developer primarily. This is going to allow us to type in any domain .test in our browser, and it's going to route that request to the correct code base. So there's a little bit of dynamic configuration that's going to happen here. I'm going to make a file called x-serve that starts with an x for alphabetical reasons because I want this file loaded last. It's the least precedent site that uh, Nginx is going to read in and serve. We'll see how that affects us in just a few minutes. OK, so we are going to make a server. That server is going to listen on port 80. We're going to make a server name of this. This is a regular expression. And what we're going to do is basically say anything.test is going to match this server, right? So any server name, anything.test will uh, end up in this configuration. Now, this regular expression is a little bit fancy. It's not just star.test, which would also work here. But in this case, we're doing it so it will capture the domain being used. And the domain being used is going to be assigned to a variable called app. That's why we have app here in brackets. The next thing we're going to do here is define the root, which is the directory under which Nginx will look for files to serve for this site. Now, note that I'm using app, the app variable, as part of the path. That means this is going to be dynamic. So any domain we use is going to get mapped to the directory that Nginx is going to use to look for our application files. The next thing we'll do is define the index. So if we uh, decide to tell Nginx to look for a directory, it's going to look inside of the directory for index.htm, index.html, and finally, index.php. And then next, we'll do our typical location block at the root URI, which is going to match all URLs. And then we're going to add a header just for our own debugging purposes, x-app. And it's going to give us the definition, uh, the value of the app variable that we used. Then we're going to use our old friend try files to try to match the exact URI 
or a directory to find files that are actually on the server. If it doesn't find those, it'll fall back to the slash index.php file. In other words, we're going to say, hey, if you don't match, if you don't see an actual file on the server in the directory you're looking at, just send this to our application and the application will handle the web request. So that's done. The next thing we need to do for our PHP application is to make a location block to handle the case when index.php is the file that's being used. That will just pass off to PHP FPM as usual. In our case, PHP FPM is listening on port 9000 at localhost. So that's what we're going to do for the fastdgi pass parameter. We have fastdgi index just to say, hey, if you don't know what uh, PHP file to serve, it's just index.php. The next thing we do is pass the parameter script file name, which is something we dynamically create here based off the document root and the uh, fast CGI script name, which isn't necessarily index.php. It's any PHP file we happen to be requesting here. Lastly, we just include fast CGI params, which is a generic instruction. The fast CGI params file already exists here for Nginx, and it just fills out the rest of the stuff that Nginx needs to do to pass off to fast CGI, so PHP FPM. OK, so we updated our Nginx configuration. Let's run Nginx-t to test that configuration. And since that's passing, we can run Nginx-s reload to reload Nginx without downtime um, so that it will read in that new configuration and you know let us serve it. OK, so we should have a server running at localhost port 80 now. Let's go ahead and do a curl request. We do that, and we see file not found. Now, again, this is an error, but it's good. It means we. Uh, are serving Nginx, Nginx is doing its thing and it's passing it off to PHP FPM, but PHP FPM is like, I don't know where that file is. We didn't make that file, right? It's looking in the right place, but the directory that it's looking in does not exist yet. So let's head back to our serve directory. We're going to make a fid directory in that, and inside of fid, it's going to be a slash public directory, so fid slash public. Now remember, the document root, the root, uh, has a public directory in it. Inside of that public directory, we're going to create an index.php file. And all that's going to do in our case is just spit out PHP info. So we can save and quit that and try to serve it. Before we do that, I just want to check out the Nginx configuration one more time and just review. Now, our app name is going to be fid, right? We made a directory named fid. So the domain we need to use to reach it is fid.test. That is going to look in users for developer serve app public for that index.php file. So let's head over to Safari and then we can type in fid.test and we'll see that it loads our site we get the PHP info page. OK, so we created a generic configuration that works for our kind of just regular PHP apps. I want to create a setup that's going to work for a multi-tenant app, right? One that's going to uh, respond to any subdomain that I use. So I'm going to make a configuration specifically for our site. I'm just going to call it my app.test, and we'll see how we do it. Let's go ahead and make a new file. It's going to be a-serve, because I want this file loaded first. And this file is actually empty, so let's just back out of this, and we're going to copy the old configuration into our new configuration. So we'll uh, you know, copy the x-serve to a new file. We'll rename that a-serve, and then we have a place to start from. OK, so in here, what do we need to adjust? Well, remember I said I'm going to use my app.test as the domain. So I want the server name to respond to two things. One is my app.test, and two is any subdomain I use. This will look still pretty familiar. So we'll just add my app.test. And then we're going to adjust that regular expression to uh, respond to anything uh, that ends in .myapp.test. But in this case, instead of the app variable, we're just going to rename that variable tenant. So we'll uh, search or we'll assign the value of that to the variable tenant. And then we can update our root just to uh, always go to the my app directory, because that doesn't need to be dynamic anymore. And then we will adjust our header. So it's x tenant instead of x app. We'll give it the value of the variable tenant instead of app, because app doesn't exist anymore. And then we can, just for fun, send a fast CGI parameter called tenant with the value of that tenant variable to PHP. So our server super global in PHP will have the value of the tenant as well. Although if we didn't have that, PHP could still just search for the domain being used to access the site in order to get that subdomain. This, though, is just a little simpler. OK, let's save and quit that. We're going to do our nginx-t to test it, and then we can do nginx-s reload, uh, assuming our test pass, which it did. And that'll reload the configuration, and then we can test out this site configuration. Now, of course, we need to make the directories for my app. So we'll head to the serve directory. We'll create a my app slash public directory, and in there, we'll create an index.php file. So in this index.php file is just some stuff. We're just going to spit out the tenant, right? So we're going to search within the server super global for tenant. If it is empty, we're just going to name the tenant default. Otherwise, we get the value of the tenant. And then we just say the tenant is whatever the tenant happens to be. 
Let's head on over to our browser. We'll see that the domain myapp.test is just my default, right? The tenant is default. We can test out a subdomain. I'm just going to do foo.myapp.test and we can see the tenant is foo. We can try bar also. The tenant is bar. Perfect. Super quickly for anyone not using PHP, you might need your Nginx configuration to proxy to an HTTP based application instead of PHP's uh, fast CGI, right? PHP FVM. So here's what that configuration looks like. In the first case here, we have uh, the same setup that allows for a multi-tenant setup, except you can see the try files is a little different, right? It sends requests to this thing called at app, and there's a location at app which proxies over HTTP to some other location, right? In this case, it is a application that might be listening on localhost at port 8000. We have a second option here also for a more generic setup that maps to an application running in some specific directory, exactly like PHP setup, except we're proxying over HTTP instead of to fast CGI to PHP FVM, right? With the same setup, we have this named location block called at app, and we're proxying to that. All right, that is basically it. We are all set with local development in a multi-tenant setup. I just have one last note. If you are a Laravel PHP developer, you might want to try out Laravel Herd. Laravel Herd basically does all the stuff we just did, except you just install this one thing, and that is basically it. Laravel Herd will package up PHP and Nginx and DNS mask and all that stuff for you so that you don't need to install it yourself. So if you want to install it, you can head on over to the website click download for Mac OS. We'll download it. We'll open it up. We will drag it over to our application directory and then find it wherever it is in our application directory and of course open it. Once it's open, we can click let's get started and it downloads PHP and the stuff it needs to. And then we can click automatically launch herd on system startup and let's get started. This is going to open documentation for it. We don't really need or want that right now. So let's just head back over to the terminal and check out what we just did. Okay, so by default, we get a herd directory. Inside of the herd directory, we can create apps, right? This is a very similar setup where it wants an app directory that's going to map to the domain name. And also inside of there, it expects a public directory to be the web root. So let's make a directory. I'll just call it my herd. And in my herd, we'll make a public directory. And inside of that public directory, we'll make an index.php file. This index.php file is just going to echo some string. So we'll save and quit that. We can head into our my app directory and do herd open, and that will open our browser and load the site. And great, it works. Now, the last thing we want to test here is actually subdomains, right? So let's go in here. We'll just enter in sub subdomain, whatever.myherd.app, and we'll see that it works. It still goes to the same code base, right? It still goes to the same index.php file. So wildcard subdomains here work just fine out of the box without doing any of the stuff that we just spent all that time configuring manually. So Laravel herd is a great option if you want to do this without having to configure any stuff on your computer. Okay, so I hope this was really helpful for local development. Keep your eyes peeled to this channel because I'm going to be doing some more videos about Nginx and server setup for this configuration in production, right? For a multi-tenant setup. So I'd really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button and keep your eyes peeled for future videos.